Good morning. Come on in to the health presentation. Those of you who have the reward card for the $50 giant gift card, your card will be punched at the conclusion of this presentation. So again, good morning. My name is Susan Sims Marsh. I am president of the AKA Foundation of Central Pennsylvania and a proud member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, Epsilon Sigma Omega Chapter. Good morning. My name is Courtney Brown and I am president of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, Epsilon Sigma Omega Chapter here in the capital city of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where we have been proudly serving for over 71 years. Today, we welcome you to a day of advocacy for health, wellness, during It's About You conference with our expo of many, many guests. And also just like to say that Epsilon Sigma Omega chapter brings you the AKA Health Village, empowering our families with self-care coloring book and families with support in mental health and wellness. Lean on your wealth with savings in your bank accounts. Equip you with your social advocacy with the first step of voter registration. And today, we also make sure that you are encouraged to enhance your environment with information about community gardens and that harvest this season. So let's get excited for an outstanding program here at our AKA Health Village. Thank you, Courtney. The AKA Foundation of Central Pennsylvania would not, in collaboration with Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, Epsilon Sigma Omega Chapter, would not be able to host this expo without our sponsors. And today, I am so delighted that Highmark, here in the Central Pennsylvania, Thania area is the presenting sponsor for this AKA village. I now would turn it over to Judith Wyndham, a representative from Highmark. Judith. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So Susan and Madam President. On behalf, I'm Judy Wyndham and on behalf of Highmark, and Highmark Whole Care. We are so proud to be this year's presenting sponsor of the AKA Health Village. Highmark has a deep history of providing for its community beyond the basics of health insurance. Some of you may remember Fun, Fit, and Fabulous Women's Health Conference from back in the days. Today, you will hear inspiring messages and helpful information from the panelists, and you will learn valuable ways of living healthier, happier lives. So enjoy your day and don't forget it's all about you today. Thank you and have a great day. The AKA Foundation of Central Pennsylvania and Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, Epsilon Sigma Omega, is all about bringing along the next generation. If you were with us last year, you had an opportunity to see Grant Fleming, who joined us. He, was, he now is a recent graduate from, from Lincoln University and has plans to attend medical school. And so we're excited that Grant, let's give him a hand, is joining us again. And I will turn it over to Grant for the present, for the introductions. Grant. Hi, thank you very much for that. So today we have a great panel of doctors here. On the far left, we have Dr. Karima Fitzgerald. Ms. Fitzgerald specializes in trauma surgery and is board certified in surgical critical care and surgery by the American Board of Surgery. She practices acute care and trauma surgery with UPMC. Dr. Dr. Fitzgerald completed her fellowship at Penn State, Hers Penn State Health Milton S. Hershey Medical Center and her residency at UPMC Pinnacle in medical education at Indiana University School of Medicine. Then to her right, we have Dr. Carlos Cream. 
Dr. Cream specializes in internal medicine and is board certified by the American Board of Internal Medicine. He practices at UPMC and earned his medical degree at Dartmouth Medical School and completed his residency at Penn State University College of Medicine. Then over here to his right, we have Dr. J.C. Knight. She's board certified in OB-GYN with over 20 years experience and currently serving as the Associate Chief Medical Officer for Jefferson Health Cherry Hill Hospital. She is working on community cancer screening and health equity. And then we have Dr. Momon Nelson. Siobhan Momon Nelson is, a certi is certified in OBGYN by the American Osteopathic Board of Obstetrics and Gynecology. She practices at UPMC OBGYN Specialists. She also received her MBA from Prairie View and A&M University and obtained her medical degree from Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. Dr. Nelson is currently the chair of OBGYN at, at, of the OBGYN department at UPMC Carlisle. And then I'll hand it over to Good morning. Good morning. Oh, that was great. Thank you all for coming this morning. And I also want to thank my colleagues for being able to um, come out this morning. I will tell you, Dr. Cream has to leave a little bit early because um, unfortunately, we work like seven days a week. Um, so he is also, he's taking some time out from working to come over here today. I'm actually gonna come down there because if you all have questions, I wanna be able to use the microphone to, so you all can ask your questions. However, this is an opportunity for you to ask whatever you wanna ask about with regards to prevention screening, about certain, certain health conditions, if you have something specific or whatever, but this is an opportunity for you all to ask a whole lot of different questions. Uh, last year when we had this, um, this panel, we talked a lot about COVID and COVID vaccinations and immunizations and um, things like that along the lines because a lot of people have different questions about that. So with just a quick show of hands, how many people want to know about the current recommendations about regarding immunizations? Okay. And so um, how many are you how many of you all are still concerned about COVID and want to know about what's going on about COVID? Okay. And um, have you all heard about the new recommendations about RSV vaccination? Right. Okay. And so um, definitely I want you all to um, make sure you ask your questions and so forth like that. And so the wonderfulness about what I do as a specialist, as an OBGYN specialist, sometimes I um, just do just women's health care, but that's why I have my colleagues to also assist with answering some questions. And so um, I'm going to pass it either to Dr. Knights or Dr. Cream to talk about the most current recommendations for COVID screening. <laughs> Hello. Oh, okay. Good morning. Good morning. It's so good to see you guys here. Thank you for coming out. Um, so Dr. Moma Nelson wanted us to start with COVID. Um, as all of you know, COVID is still here with us, although we've done a pretty good job of keeping things in check. Um, right now, we are starting to see a surge of COVID. Um, we are getting more and more COVID infections as it gets cooler. Um, our hospital is seeing a significant uptick in uh, COVID infections and ICU admissions for COVID, unfortunately. Right now, our recommendation is to make sure that you're up to date with the COVID vaccine, the new COVID vaccine that just came out. Um, and we are looking forward to having most of our population get that COVID vaccine. Um, also making sure that you have your COVID test. So if anybody in the household feels ill to quickly test, um, the COVID tests are free from the government. They do send you, they have had a round of COVID tests that came through. You can go to, I think, covid.gov and get free tests sent to your house. And that's just to make sure that if you have a positive COVID infection, that you isolate and you protect the people around you so that they don't get COVID. Um, unfortunately, it's still here, but we really know how to manage this infection and to keep it in check. Are there any questions about COVID and what you're doing with it? 
Uh, what are your recommendations for Paxlovid for people who are test positive for COVID? So generally speaking, my recommendation is to get a telehealth appointment with your provider. Your provider can go through your risks and can talk to you about the benefits of Paxlovid. Paxlovid works very nicely, especially for people who are at risk uh, for having the COVID infection um, do damage to them. So I recommend an appointment. Uh, lots of providers and um, health insurances are offering telehealth appointments so that you can go over your risks and to see if you are um, able to get Paxlovid. After, um, having, after having COVID, and um, do you recommend getting the new vaccine? Can you hear me? Sorry. Um, after having COVID, is it recommended to get the new vaccine? Okay, so after having COVID, is it recommended to get the new vaccine? So the general recommendations are that after you have a COVID infection, and please, colleagues, if you have anything else to add, um, <laughs> that please add. But after you have a COVID infection, they generally ask you to wait. You can wait a couple of months. I think the recommendation was 90 days and then get the new vaccine. So one of the things I'll add to that, and maybe everyone should use this microphone, um, <laughs> is that uh, COVID is a virus and it's constantly changing. And so that's why the vaccines are being updated, similar to influenza and why they talk about a yearly recommendation. So viruses are constantly something that depends on our body to exist. A bacteria will exist without us and waiting for us. Viruses, we transmit back and forth. Once you get a particular strain, you have immunity against that strain, but it's constantly evolving. That, evolving, that evolution is a slow process normally. And so we call that a drift. A shift is when there's a big change and we're not ready for it, meaning we don't have immunity to that next variant. That's why when you see big variants, they're trying to figure out how closely related they are to the prior variant. The closer it is to the prior variant, the more your immunity from the, from the vaccine you already had or your prior exposure protects you. When it's a big change, that's when more severe disease recurs. I hope that sinks in a little bit. And the uh, more chronically ill you are means the less strength you have, the less reserve you have to fight it off if it's more severe. In those cases, you want to be the person who's up to date and getting your Paxlovid as soon as possible because it's trying to slow down the degree of inflammatory response in your body that overwhelms you while your body is trying to clear the virus. Yeah. <laughs> Because that was pretty amazing. Well, I also wanted just to add, um, as uh, someone who takes care of pregnant women, and it appears that we have a mature crowd. Cheers, shout out to the mature people. Um, but uh, uh, COVID vaccination is safe for women who are pregnant. You'll hear it on um, social media and and from people who are not healthcare providers that vaccination is not safe but those things are safe in pregnancy because the goal the goal is for us to protect the people who are immunocompromised um you can get all these vaccinations at your local pharmacy you can get all these vaccinations at the same time sometimes i will tell you people will say that they feel a little ill if they get their flu vaccine and their COVID booster at the same time however that's like your body just with an immune response. It doesn't mean that one of these vaccinations made you sick. That's just an immune response that, that occurs. Next question. I am a senior and I've never taken a flu shot. And I was thinking about doing it this year, but I don't know if it's safe for taking for me taking the because I have never had a flu shot. So taking the, you know, the other shots, would it be safe taking both shots together? Yeah. 
The simple answer is yes. Uh, the these. The more the, the the bigger answer is you will feel your body responding to it, but that's what you want to happen because the immunologic response that you're generating is what fights off the virus when you actually get it, and so you will feel you may feel some degree of warmth tenderness, but it's nothing like getting because it's an inactivated virus. You're not getting live virus. You're not giving actual flu or even COVID for that matter. Uh, they're giving you something to that works against part of that virus to protect you when you actually get it. So the idea of it being safe, as long as you're not allergic to any of the things that are a part of it, it, it will be fine. And it would be recommended because, again, the idea is if for those people who have had severe reaction to the virus, to the immunization, their body would have been that much more reactive when they got the actual live virus. And that's something that, they don't, that you don't really think about. Your body, that's just a big word, the response. Some people are more bigger responders than others. And once you get it, oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was like, um, I don't want the virus. Uh, so uh, you, your, your body is geared up, and that, that's something that you quite honestly rather know from the immunization than from the virus itself, from the live virus when you get it. Because you will be, you will ultimately, those people wind up hospitalized and we're contending with other complications from the entire infection. And if I could add to that, I, it's a common thing to hear people say, when I got the flu vaccine, it gave me the flu. And just to emphasize what he's saying, that's not true. It didn't give you the flu. Your body, you felt your body responding like we wanted to to what we're giving it to what we're giving you to boost your immunity so that's a response that your body is naturally going to do it's you know it's sometimes it's not pleasant but it's definitely better than having the actual infection which can land you in the hospital and can make you very sick the other thing with that as well is that as our bodies age unfortunately if we live long enough we will get old um your immune defenses go down even further. And so the best thing that you can do is prevent anything possible. So getting these vaccines is extremely important, especially as we get older, in order to prevent life-threatening illness and being put into the hospital. A lot of times, once you get to that point where you're that sick, the likelihood of you having a serious negative outcome is much higher, especially as we get older. So if you can get your vaccinations and you can tolerate them as long as you're not allergic, then I think that's the best way to go. Uh, I want, I, oh, I'm loud, aren't I? Um, I want to know how reliable are the COVID tests that have expired? They tell you you can still use them, but what is the reliability if you actually use one and you come up negative? That's a great question. I, I only know what I've heard from the CDC, which is that they have a website. CDS, CDC has a website for everything. Um, they have a website and you can look on the website and look at your serial number and on the website, it will tell you if it's still good to use. And that's our best judge. Um, as time has progressed, they've done more studies and they realized that some of these tests can last longer than it was actually put on the box. Um, but that's your best test is to go to the website and, and compare and see. And why are so many people against the uh, COVID or any vaccine uh, shots? I understand what's, oh, why are so many people against the uh, COVID shot or any vaccines, flu um, shots? What's the myth about all that? So I think a lot of things have to do with our overall trust of the healthcare process and system. And I think a lot of people, especially since when COVID started, it was unknown. And I think that there was a lot of fear that people had that the vaccine came out so quickly as if they were preparing for this. And so the natural distrust of the whole healthcare system, I think, is the reason why a lot of people were hesitant to even go forward with it. And even now, even though we're, you know, three plus years into this whole pandemic, people still don't think that the government or the CDC or all these other entities were 
being forthright in the beginning. And I think that was a big part of why people were so hesitant. It's very similar to things like the Tuskegee experiment and all the other things that have been done that put us at risk for other things. And now we don't trust it. I would agree. I, I would agree with that completely. And that's what that, again, the key word there is fear. Uh, and to a degree, there was well, with the J&J, &J, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, again, because there was a haste because of the pandemic and it wasn't necessarily planned for, uh, there was a faster process. And while they had to skip some steps, of right here it was called an EU, e -E -U -A, emergency use authorization, meaning we had to skip some steps to get this out here to save some more lives than we would have normally. And so there was a healthy distrust, but the idea was that the best intent was still there. The J&J &J having the increased risk of the, uh, the strokes and the, and the clots was real. It did happen. And so those are things that people didn't know about and they were worried about. It. Now we've gotten a lot more data and we know what's happening with these things. And so those things should be alleviated. Now we still have people who just distrust the government again for historical reasons, which we still have to unearth uh, and, and address. I, I actually... I actually was curious about whether um, everybody knows what cancer screenings are due for them. Is everybody up to date with their cancer screenings? Do you know which cancer screenings are appropriate for your age and gender? And I wondered if anybody had any thoughts about that. Colon, colon, we have a, a discussion about colonoscopy over here. Colonoscopy is... Um, we used to say that we should start screening colonoscopies at age 50. Several years ago, it actually came out that um, African Americans should be start screening at age 45. However, the American Cancer Society has actually changed the age that all people, regardless of race, should have screening at age 45. So let's just do a quick show of hands. If you are older than 45, put your hands up. Okay, now put your hands down. If you've had a screening colonoscopy, put your hands up. Oh my goodness, that makes my heart so proud. <laughs> That's great. Okay. Now I have one other question. If you're scared to do the colonoscopy, put your hands up. All right. Okay. <laughs> a lot of times people talk about um, the prep and, oh my goodness, the prep and, oh my goodness, the prep. However, colon cancer is one of the cancers that are, are easily diagnosed and treated and your prognosis um, and your survival rate is very high when it's treated. So um, I... Myself, Dr. Fitzgerald, and Dr. Cream all work for UPMC, and so I would. I have wonderful colleagues at UPMC that um, are um, colorectal surgeons and gastroenterologists. And if if you would like a referral or of who I would refer you to, please let me know afterwards. And because um, I I have wonderful colleagues that I refer my patients to. Yes. I Guard as an option. So funny. To, I was, to, that's what I was yeah. picking up the mic to say. Um, so I, I just want to say that if you are super afraid of the colonoscopy and you're just not there yet, you can't get yourself there, um, your doctor would love for you to get there. But if you just can't get there quite yet, talk to your doctor about Cologuard or a fit test. There are alternatives. They are not as good as the colonoscopy. Colonoscopy is still the gold standard, but some screening is better than no screening. And so I would love for you to at least speak to your doctor about alternatives. Um, rather than just saying, I'm not doing that, um, let's talk about some other ways that we can screen for colon cancer to make sure that we're keeping you safe. I think another thing too is that we have to ask ourselves, why are we afraid of this test? 
What is it that's ingrained in us that tells us that we shouldn't go through with it? Or what is it that you're really, truly afraid of? Are you afraid of the actual procedure itself? Because I've done a ton of colonoscopies and I can tell you they're not as much fun for the patient or me, but <laughs> they're necessary and they actually do prevent a lot of long-term issues. But what I have found is that most people are afraid of it because of the stigma associated with where the scope goes. So what is the question that you have or what is the problem that you face when you think about getting a colonoscopy? Is it the procedure or is it the potential diagnosis? And one more thing to add to that is, and I'll let my colleagues speak more about this, lack of getting this screening early on leads to later detection of the cancer. One of the major health disparities we have is that because we don't do the screening or are not offered the screening in many cases early enough, we find disease at a much later state, which means a much worse outcome. And that's why it's important to get the screening when it's offered and as early as possible so we can detect things while they're still small enough to be treated. We have a question here. Uh, would you advocate getting genetic testing to rule out, you're t we're talking about colon cancer now, but there are other cancers that are, affect people. Would genetic testing uh, help to reveal if you are a potential candidate for other pancreatic, pan pancreatic cancer? So I think more often than not, we don't recommend genetic testing unless there's a family history, a very strong family history of some sort of um, underlying illness or cancer. I don't think that there's a significant benefit of just doing prophylactic screening unless you do have that um, family history. Ancestry.com and 23andMe and those offer you the health screening and they're going to tell you those things as well. Use those with caution because, as again, cancer is, it may tell you what particular, what your DNA looks like, but it does not tell you that you're going to have cancer. It's always a multi factor, multi step process to developing cancer. And so, when you get that, it causes a lot more anxiety uh, if you don't know what to do with that information. And so, genetic testing comes with requirements that you're going to see a geneticist to know what to do with that information before you start trying to. Google it and figure it out for yourself what it means and stress yourself out. Dr. Mama Nelson, I loved your idea about raising the hand. So can we ask about lung cancer? So how many people here are over the age of 50? Okay. And how many people know their risk for lung cancer? Okay, and out of those people who know their risk of lung cancer, how many of those people have been screened for lung cancer? Okay, so just as a, um, as a reminder, so your risk of lung cancer is significantly increased over the age of 50 with more than 20 years of smoking. If you've been smoking for 20 years, then please talk to your provider about getting a simple screen for lung cancer. It definitely has been shown to catch lung cancers earlier and decrease the chance of dying by 30% for lung cancer. So it had nothing to do with it had it had nothing to do with smoking, but being around smokers. There are other reasons to get lung cancer, not just smoking, but smoking is the most common. It's associated with ninety percent of the lung cancers that we have in the country. I have to go, but thank you. No, don't. thank you, Dr. Cream. We have another question here. Uh, uh, yes, the prostate detect cancer for that yeah prostate cancer oh, yes. yeah you can get that. right yes, now sir. I had my prostate uh, checked out uh, I don't like the way it's the procedures with that oh. that, that hurt it <laughs> is there is there another way that could be done I mean uh, that, that was painful <laughs> I mean, if, to me. Yeah. So there's actually a table back there. You should stop by and see the good colonel. He talks about um, advocacy and prostate. 
So if you get a chance after all of this is over, go talk to him for sure. Unfortunately, some of the most primitive tests that we have in, involve using our fingers to feel things. And I know it feels very invasive, but that is probably the easiest test that we can do. Sometimes people can get what's called a PSA or prostate specific antigen, which is a blood test that can be drawn, but that number can be elevated for a lot of different reasons. And it's not necessarily indicative of the fact that you have prostate cancer. So it's more of a trend than anything else. But if they can feel a mass, then obviously that's more concerning and leads to a different workup. So. Okay, thank you. One of the other things that we as gynecologists do, um, I'm going to come back here, is um, uh, pap smear screenings. And, well, I'm sorry, screening for cervical cancer. And that's one of the questions that I get asked often about who should have a pap smear, how often we should have a pap smear, and so forth. And those recommendations have changed significantly over the course of my career as a physician. And so um, I will say that just in general, we start screening at age 21. And if you are a mature woman and you are over the age of 65 without risk factors and so forth, and if your gynecologist says that you don't need it, you can stop screening at the age of 65. Or if you've had a hysterectomy for what we say benign reasons, so you didn't, you had a hysterectomy for it, not cancer, you don't have to have a screening. But no one likes to see the gynecologist, right? No, we don't. That's not true. My okay. patients love to come and see me, miss. Okay. I don't know what you're doing over here at UPMC, but my patients love to come for their pap smear. <laughs> that's the other test that feels a little bit invasive when it's done. However, that's just how we, you know, it's just how we do it. So, but it is, um, as a gynecologist, I often see women once a year who are overall healthy. And so I do a lot of their primary care preventative screenings, like ordering their mammograms and their colonoscopies, um, because not because their primary care doctor doesn't do it, but sometimes I act as the primary care doctor. So, um, breast cancer screening. I was actually going to hold on the breast cancer screening just Absolutely. because, um, at noon, Dr. Knights is going to stay and kind of talk about patient advocacy, but also talk a little bit about breast cancer screening and awareness. Um, so that's why I was holding that at that time. Yes, we have a question here. Why do they stop giving the pap smears to women after a certain age? Well, we don't necessarily have to stop giving them at, at a certain age. That is, that's always a conversation that I feel like has to happen with the, as a patient physician relationship. And so say for instance, I have a woman who is 68 years old and, um, she is still sexually active. She has a history of having abnormal pap smears. She might even had surgery for an abnormal pap smear or whatever. That is a discussion about whether we continue to screen versus we not screen. However, say I have another woman who is 68 years old, who is not sexually active, who has a history of all normal pap smears and um, her risk of getting HPV, which is human papillomavirus, we know that that is a virus that causes the cells on the cervix to be abnormal, subsequently can cause an abnormal pap smear, which can subsequently turn into cervical cancer if left untreated. That woman has decreased risk of ever having an abnormal pap smear or cervical cancer. But again, that's part of the conversation that happens. Just because our guidelines say that we can stop screening, that doesn't mean that we absolutely stop screening. I'm not really sure how much time we have, but I want to make sure that side of the room has been really quiet. I feel like I need to come over there to ask some questions over there to see if anybody has any questions on the other side. Oh, thank you. I'm I just want to know where where do all y'all work? 
Uh, I'm currently working at UPMC Williamsport. Okay. I work in New Jersey. <laughs> oh, so you're not local. I'm sorry, what you, I'm not oh. local. I work for Jefferson in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Okay. And Dr. Mama Nelson. I am local. Um, I work at UPMC Carlisle. So right down 81, it's not that far away. I made it here in 25 minutes. So you all are welcome to come and see me if you're looking for a gynecologist. So, or if you want to have your baby in Carlisle, I still do obstetrics too. So I'm going to come over to this side of the room so y'all don't feel left out. Any questions over here? Okay. Oh, we got another question. Hold on. I know recently the um, recommendations for women uh, having menopausal symptoms have changed, or at least not changed, but there have been some more guidance about using hormone replacement therapy for, for them. Can you speak to that? That's a wonderful question. I'll let Dr. Knight start. Wow. And I just said I'll let Dr. Mama Nelson start. Okay. Um, so menopause on average in our country is at 51. Um, and a half. That's the average age of menopause diagnosed by the absence of periods. Um, and lots of times women get certain symptoms leading up to the menopause and even some significant time after. Um, hot flashes, night sweats, vaginal dryness, decrease in libido, mental fog, um, general un well feelings. And then some people don't have any symptoms at all. So there is a wide spectrum of symptomatology. In general, the, the recommendation is that you be treated for the symptoms that affect your activities of daily living. Um, and you be treated with the smallest amount for the shortest amount of time. And that's a conversation that you need to have with your physician um, because your physician will know your medical history, know your family history, know your risks, and can have a robust discussion with you about what is optional for you, what can be done. But the first thing I would say to um, the ladies who are having those symptoms is that please go see your provider. There are plenty of things in this day and time that can help you with your symptoms. You don't have to suffer. You don't have to suffer. We have a question over here. It's me again. Yes, how long does menopause last? Menopause lasts. The symptoms? Yes. Because technically, once you stop having your period, you are menopausal, and that lasts for the rest of your life. For the symptoms, um, some people, the symptoms stop within 12 months. Some people, it stops within five years. Some people have it What's the as earliest their bestie. That someone could go through it. I'm sorry? What's the earliest you can go through menopause? Um, it really depends on your family history. Some people go in their 40s. Some people go in their 50s. Some people go in their 60s. I'm just wanting to come on. The um, National American uh, Menopausal Society recently had a meeting, and they talked about how women of color actually have menopausal symptoms starting as early as age 43. So the menopausal symptoms, like Dr. Nice was talking about, could be the hot flashes, night sweats, the brain fog, the insomnia. But those symptoms can last for 10 or plus years. But once you hit menopause, um, and again, we define menopause as no bleeding for one whole year, those symptoms might last for a really long time. Um, and can I mention that men also have some of these symptoms as they age. They can get uh, mental fog. Um, they can get a decrease in libido. They can have changes as well. So if you're having some of these changes, please get to your provider and talk to your provider because there are also treatments for that. And I think in summary... You and your provider, it's so important to have a relationship with your provider so that as things come up, as we age, different things come up, that you can have an open conversation with your provider um, to talk about what you're at risk for, to talk about what you should be treated for, what you should be looking for, all of those things. That comes with a good relationship with your provider. 
If I could just interject here, uh, we are joined by Dr. Kofi Clark. Dr. Clark is a gastroenterologist at Penn State Health and also serves as, as division chief of gastroenterology and hepatology. His primary clinical and research interests are in the care of patients with IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, and celiac disease. In addition, he treats patients with, with acute gastrointestinal conditions and offers screening for colon cancer. He graduated from the University of Ghana Medical School and completed his residency in gastroenterology and hepatology at Royal College of Physicians in London and internal medicine at Western Pennsylvania Hospital. Dr. Clark. Thank you for the kind words of introduction. Sorry I was running a few minutes late. I was hiding in the back there hanging out with the ladies. So I'm here to join you. Thank you. So I think one of the things that I, I'm sure we're going to talk about a lot more later on today is the fact that communication with your provider is extremely important. I know that a lot of times there are things that people are embarrassed about or don't know how to ask or bring up, but the relationship that you have with your providers, your primary care, whatever specialist that you see is extremely important because that's the only way that they'll be able to actually help you and diagnose things if you tell them everything that's going on. If you don't give us the cues, we don't necessarily know what exactly to look for or what you're concerned about. I think that's a great point. Absolutely great point. You have to be honest with your provider. You have to have the relationship and be honest because they cannot lead you in the right direction if you're withholding major information. I'm going to ask if anybody has any, we, we briefly talked about colonoscopies and colon cancer screening, and um, now we have the expert here in the room. So... So if, if you all have any other questions, please make sure that this is a great opportunity time to, to ask those questions, too. One other thing that as we talk about preventative care, um, we don't have any specialists here, but we... Um, I think dental health is really important. And so, um, and again as a gynecologist, but who focuses on um, a lot of primary care health for women, I always talk about the importance of good dental hygiene. So if you haven't seen your dentist at the minimum once a year, you should do that, okay? And so you should always get your eyes done and so forth. One it's other well thing known that gingivitis increases your risk for heart disease. Yes. So it's... Your entire body communicates with itself, so we have to make sure that each part is healthy. One other thing I wanted to tell, there was a question about menopause and like how long does menopause last? And we, again, we talked about how um, once you are in menopause, you are menopausal. However, if you are having any bleeding after menopause, like once you hit that one year, you went one whole year, you're 54 years old, you're, you haven't bled like in two years. And then on your 56th birthday, you start bleeding. That is a phone call to your, to your doctor. Your period did not come back. That is a phone call to your, to your doctor. Okay. Hi, just a random GI question. What's the difference between celiac disease and say like a gluten sensitivity? Thank you for asking that. Can you guys hear me well? Okay, so celiac disease is a well-defined genetic predisposed disease, okay? Where people eat certain foods and then have a reaction. Thank you. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Oh, this is worse. <laughs> okay, let's do this. Thank you. So celiac disease is a well-defined immune-mediated condition where people eat certain foods and then react. And then the lining of your small bowel doesn't absorb your vitamins and other minerals that you need. It can also be associated with things like diabetes, thyroid disease, and multiple other things. On the other hand, being sensitive, it's fairly loosely defined. So if I give you a bowl of food, pasta, rice, or whatever it is, and you react, 
it is much more difficult to tell which ingredient of the food that's coming from. If you feel you have a reaction towards certain foods, I think you need to see a specialist who would put you through a systematic way of eliminating what you might be allergic to. So if you don't have celiac disease, it's probably not in your interest to eliminate gluten containing foods because non-gluten containing foods or gluten-free foods are not fortified enough with the regular vitamins that we need. In other words, it doesn't help to self-diagnose and avoid gluten containing foods. Last thing to think about is celiac disease is extremely rare in people like all of us, okay? Extremely rare in minorities. So when you have GI symptoms and somebody tells you to avoid certain foods and you feel better please don't self-diagnose see your doctor and speak to them because you might be masking something else that you may be missing i just thought maybe um maybe you can talk a little bit about um colonoscopy screening because we had some questions about that um that the average age their age of recommendation right now is 45 are there reasons to be screened earlier are there reasons to be screened later so that's a great segue to a discussion. I'll make it brief and then and give you an opportunity to ask me as many things. So just like you heard, the average risk screening has been dropped to 45 years old. Second thing about that was, are there reasons to get screened earlier on? There are few reasons to get screened earlier on, and I'll give you a few examples. If you have a family history of a first degree relative who was diagnosed with cancer much earlier on what does that mean before the age of 60 or sometimes before the age of 50 then you're supposed to start your screening 10 years before the first diagnosis was made so that's number one. Second group of individuals is if you've had something we call inflammatory bowel disease for eight years or more then you start your screening after you've had the disease for eight years a little thing to add in the screening for colon cancer doesn't always have to be by colonoscopy. So again, think about it. If you're worried about falling asleep and having the scope and everything else, there are stool tests which can also be used in people we call average risk. So if you don't have a family history, you are very healthy and all of that, please don't avoid screening because there are other ways of screening you. Now, if we use the stool exam and it shows that there's something to be worried about, then you want to stay away from that again and then go for a colonoscopy. Medicare and other insurance companies until about a year and a half ago will not fund the colonoscopy if you do the stool test first. I'm glad to tell you that the AGA has lobbied enough that once you do that, if you need a colonoscopy, you can still get a colonoscopy covered by insurance. Any other questions that we have? Well, if we, if we don't have any other questions, I'm going to say that we can end a little bit earlier. We do have um, other different seg um, segments that are happening later today. I encourage you all to please see all the tables over on the other side. I know that there's going to be some Zumba and some other things out in the lobby to get everybody moving and so forth. And um, on behalf of the AKA Foundation of Central Pennsylvania and Epsilon Sigma Omega, I appreciate you all for coming.